we start up with our heroes having left the tower having said they'll try and reunite the princess with her love they now stand back in this wintry glade there are two archways made of floating candles in front of them at the edge of the glade which they presume lead back to the the tomb that they were exploring previously and we're going to pick up with them stood in the clearing perhaps to debate what they want to do perhaps just to jump through the portals who knows so it's over to you guys you are stood in the clearing as i've just explained well i would suggest we go back the way we come and get this <clears throat> ring and get this all sorted yes who would you suggest asks favor i would uh, i would suggest um uh, father, the father indeed i've always wanted a castle <laughs> that's not the attitude right that's not the attitude friar <clears throat> i feel a little bit let down um i haven't come all this way to furnish you with a castle as as you're having this conversation you glance to your right big mick and you can see that the the goblin you spoke to before you went in smudge it, this sort of large nosed green skinned pointy eared creature with a big pot belly is like lying in the snow there's an empty demi john lying next to him he's obviously like hit that moonshine that he was sharing with you earlier make like a freight train and that demi john is empty he's still he's still awake but he's like lying on his back staring up occasionally you see him sort of like he rubs his nose which no longer has the grumpy talking face on it and he sort of looks at it almost a little bit sadly Occasionally he reaches into the, the sort of the bum bag, the leather pouch he's got as pretty much his only clothing, but luckily it's large enough to cover his goblin unmentionables. And it, occasionally he reaches and takes out a little mushroom and like pops it into his mouth. And other than that, he just sort of sat back on a small snowbank, slightly glazed look on his face. Like I say, he's obviously hit the hooch pretty hard. And he's just sort of staring up at the sky with his legs out in front of him. <laughs> He's a bit of a character, isn't he? I wonder. I wonder. Um, I wonder about this fella's capabilities. I wonder if we could wrangle him into our crew. And as he's as he's lying there, he starts singing a a, a little ditty about what, what you think, presume, is the ancient battle that's been discussed, and quite startlingly. He appears to have an amazing singing voice, almost like a, almost like a choral sort of singing voice, which I won't attempt to render here because my own singing voice is somewhat lamentable. But <laughs> hey, you, you know, if, you, if you've ever heard like a, if you've ever heard like choir boys sing and they're able to reach those ridiculously high notes and that sort of clarity of pitch, his voice sounds very similar. Like I say, he doesn't really seem to be aware of you guys. He's almost sort of singing it to himself as he sort of looks up at these twinkling stars above him. Oh, right. I thought, he, I thought he'd maybe, like, passed out or something. No, so, he's, he, he's, oh, a, he's right. got a bit of a glazed expression on his face. Yeah. But uh... I, I, Right, OK. I, I'll wait for him to... I don't want to interrupt his his little ditty there, so perhaps let him get to get get to the bit where there's an instrumental break or something and, <laughs> <laughs> and then just uh just like nudge him nudge him up and say hey, hey, smudge okay so he's like it and smudge, winter it? shall come to the forest <laughs> never more and then you're like Oi, bravo smudge. bravo smudge he turns around and he's like oh uh, sorry sorry didn't and he like struggles to focus on you he's like oh didn't didn't see you there, uh, big un. What can I do for you? What are you doing just now? Are you busy? Do you fancy coming coming he's, up, up he's top like, with us? He's like, nah, I, I am busy. He's like, to, to be honest, there's not a lot to do around here uh, apart from when they uh, they run out of food for like the guests or some more guests come in, and then obviously they send like me and the boys out to go foraging. But aside from that, it's a bit boring to be honest with you. Oh well. Come and have a bit of excitement. We're going to go and find a ring for the uh, the the princess. The, the uh, yeah, the princess. 
and he's like he's like oh uh all right um he says wow well, what what you want to ring for well uh she she was betrothed to a beloved sir chide and uh yeah she wants the ring back so we we're going we're gonna get it she She's well, going to grant us a wish. We've got things to sort out, you know. Well, if you it gets if it gets this endless this endless pre wedding meal over with, God, it's been going on for ages. If it gets this over with, well, I'm all for it, mate. I'm all for it. Oh, well, will tag along. Come come join us. But I mean, you know, you might even find a few mushrooms or something like that that you've uh, you've not noticed before. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to make me a charisma roll. Yeah, good luck with that. I'm going to give you a plus two to your roll because you've appealed to his love of mushrooms and you okay. have ingratiated yourself <laughs> previously with him. Plus, okay. he seems to regard you as distantly related to his oh, kind. Yeah. You're not sure you understand yeah. why, but that does predispose him well towards well, you. So, well, I did get that little bit of a a little bit of insight there previously with the. Uh... That's it. Oh, and I got a minus one, so I got a. Oh, you give me a t so I've got a plus one. I've got a net, a net plus one. So I've got a twelve there in total, which is he, a bit dank. He, he looks, he looks interesting, but he's like, wow. Well, I'm not sure. Is that I, I'd like to, but you know, I'm not sure. I might, I might get in trouble for for like abandoning my duties, like. And uh, he says, Oof. well, I'm not sure about that. I mean, you, you know what them sort of gestures like to the tower with his thumb. He's like. You know what them sort can be like when they get angry. Well, I'm not sure I do, but I can imagine. I can imagine. He said he sort of yawns in an over exaggerated fashion and stretches his arms, and he says, "Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd need it'd need to be worth my while if I was going to uh, abandon my post." Just saying. Well, what are we talking? He says, uh, "I don't know. Uh, what are you offering?" Hmm. I ain't got too much in the offering stakes, if I'm honest. I don't know about me. Uh, maybe ten gold springs to mind. <laughs> we got some gold coins. I don't know. I don't know. He looks uh, like he's like gold. Get serious. Well, well I'll tell what, you what. what good gold to me. I tell you what. If you now, I tell you, I've got just the thing for you. An all expenses paid trip to Great London. How does that grab you? Back. <laughs> Back there with your old, I tell you what, it's got the finest community of of uh, folk, much like yourself. All the all the high life there. Oh, mate! And as for opportunities for performance and singing, you can you can sing to the Queen of uh, uh, the Midland, uh, not the Midlands. Oh crap! My law has defeated me. <laughs> It's like England. not England. Pretend England. It's <laughs> it's like he it leans a bit closer, looking quite interesting. He's like, well, t -t -t tell me a bit more about this Great London and this uh, this community of goblins. What, what, what's it like? Well, I tell you, it's it's something to behold. Uh, see the quiet fella with the well with the robes. I was going to say the knives, but you can't see them. The, the the robes here. Is that, he, is that what? The one who looks like a corpse? Yeah, the one who looks like a corpse on a good day. Him there, he could tell you all about them. I mean, I, I, I don't partake myself, but the mushrooms, the mushrooms in Great London, mate, I tell he, you. He looks up and he like jiggles his like pouch a bit and he's like, what good is this? Well, like I say, I mean, he's your man over there. Um, he, he leans round Big Mick and he's like, are oh, the mushrooms where you come from as good as these? And he like jiggles his pouch in your direction, Jack Doll. Uh, I nod. Uh, like after, let's say, like 10 seconds of contemplative look on my face. Uh, yeah. He, he, Smudge looks back to you, Mick, and he's like, fucking hell, I wish you shut up. I can't get a word in edgeways. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, it's, a, it's a struggle. He, he's like, well, sure. I, I, I tell you, I, I assume I'll be getting a. I'll be getting like I'll be getting some sort of recompense, but yeah, we could talk about that later. I tell you what, how about I come with you for now, and we'll we'll see how it goes for a bit, and then obviously, I've got until you go overseas to like 
make my mind up so if it ain't working out and come back in no i'm done how's yeah, that it's, yeah it's just a casual thing i yeah. thought you might you know a little bit of excitement for you you you've you've done us a good turn i wouldn't want you to miss out on an opportunity of a lifetime you know you you, you can go and see the big city the lights he uh, says wow well, yeah the sights, uh, you know if like you say there's a uh, there's like a community of goblins over there and well they like the mushrooms as well I'm up any pats his like pouch. I might be onto a tidy little earner there. Oh yeah, and you wanna you wanna see the goblin crumpet as well, mate. He's I like, ain't joking, I ain't joking, he's like, you know what I'm saying? Go on. No, I can't. I could, I, 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 I couldn't do it justice, so I'll say no more. I'll draw a veil over it. You you got to see it with your own eyes. He says, right, sounds good to me. He's like, right, where are we going for time? Up these ear stairs, I reckon. He says, ah, that might be a bit of a problem. Huh? He said, you see, you see those archways over there. He's like, well, you know, I reached through and like pulled you through before. Yeah. He's like, I can't go all the way through them. It's not allowed. To be honest, really, I shouldn't have reached through and pulled you through, really. But no one were looking, so I thought, where's the arm? And to be honest... I'm pretty sure that only, I don't think it had worked on any of them, any like gestures at the rest of your companions. I only think it worked on you because of, well, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. To be I'm honest, I'm surprised you can use them. So, uh, he says, how about this, right? You know where I met you before? When, I came, when I came out the trap door, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. like, how about I pop through the trap door. I wait there. When you've done whatever you're doing, come and meet me where you met me before. Then we'll see what's going. Oh, yeah. After a short discussion, the group decide to return back through the archway to the tomb that they were previously exploring. To the archway. Yeah. Now, as you guys step through the archway, you, without there being any sort of intervening sense of traveling across space or anything like that you the scenery around you just like changes and you find yourself in this stone worked passage over this carved stone steps if you look back through the archway you can see beyond it not the winter glade that you've just been stood in but a small round chamber so with water covering the floor and a statue in the center of it that was the chamber that you were trying to go to originally however yeah. to get to it you have to go through the archway and that's how you ended up in the, the oh so day. we were never actually in that chamber nope. okay right right however as you're all sort of like obviously i've put you back in the room because it's on a different level but as you all emerge from the the archway immediately you all feel this sense of tremendous well-being and this sense of inner peace it's almost like a a golden wave that washes over you and it's as you sort of walk slowly away it's 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 a beautiful thing i mean if you're a, an emotional person it might almost bring a tear to your right it's that wonderful but as you start sort of walking away from them up the stairs towards the chamber this feeling gradually starts to recede the further you get from the archway facing you is the white marble statue of a beautiful woman that you all now know to be the same princess you've spoken to long flowing hair wearing similar robes to those you saw in and has the the telltale sort of star symbol on her forehead over the the statues posed with a finger to its lips and is looking at the staircase that you're emerging from however there is a black cloth blindfold over the statue's eyes. Yeah, now we know from when the lieutenant lifted it up that on the inside of the black blindfold, which is just normal cloth, although quite fine, there was gold embroidered crucifixes on the inside of the blindfold. Uh, yeah, some sort of ward or something, perhaps, yeah. As you, as you sort of look at this room, so like looking down the corridor friar you can see what appear to be almost like pews like you would see in a church uh, you can from where even from where you are you see that they're obviously badly cracked and damaged and you can see a few bits of mold and signs of decay on them and that beyond is what looks to be a large stone oblong perhaps an altar or a, a plinth where 
in days gone by a priest might have stood to deliver a sermon you're not sure so as you walk in you walk past these pews and it's almost a little sad to yourself fry to see the the poor state of decay and how the damp has got to, to these wooden pews it must have once been a, a beautiful small chapel but like everything in here age and neglect have taken their toll to the west of you is what appears to be a large tapestry and just ahead of you to the north is what appears to be a stone altar there is a statue of a regal looking gentleman so on the altar just like the upper half of his body dressed as a crusader you know wearing armor flowing robes etc and holding its hand aloft and sat on the hand appears to be a thick red wax candle some of the it's obviously been lit previously although it's not lit now because some of the wax has dribbled over the stone hand of the statue and has sort of frozen in those almost like sort of icicle like patterns that melting wax makes there's a velvet cloth on the altar although it too has suffered from the ravages of time and it's partially disintegrated and worn away Okay. Um, is there anything? Is, is the altar kind of like a stone block, or is it more of a table? Yeah, it's a it's a large stone block. Okay. Um, okay. Looking over to the west of you, as I said, you can see this tapestry. It appears to show a a warrior. Uh, you can actually see some of the heraldry of Gale on his armor uh, like i say but it's just like a flat tapestry uh, it appears to be a a depiction of some sort of afterlife experience or perhaps the gates of having you know golden gates light coming out of it and there are two figures dressed again as warriors of gale who appear to be walking towards this light and the you as you watch them you can see that they they appear to be walking quite close to each other, you know, as friends might walk closely with each other. Okay. Um, and is there anything behind the tapestry, or is it kind of stuck to the wall? Okay, you you sort of you see the tapestry is on like a bit of a rail, so you like you pull it to one side, and you can see behind it what appears to be a wooden door. It's got like a sort of standard metal lock in it. However, you can tell just by looking at the door that it, obviously the damp has got to it, and the wood is quite badly swollen. I'll see if I can um, I'll see if I can work a little magic on that door and get that open there, that locked door. Okay, now looking at it with your expert skills, Big Mick, you think that there's going to be two problems with this door. One, obviously, the lock. That's your jam. However, two of them, the second problem, is that the door is actually swollen in its frame. So you think even if the lock yeah. is picked, it's going to require some force to like push it open. But if you yeah. want to have a go at picking the lock, you can certainly do that. Now I think this uh I think this here door needs a good old smashing. This will need a good old fashioned uh, bit of elbow grease to get this open, I feel. The finer points of um locksmithing will not suffice. So I I get my um uh, my axe out. It's a two hander as well. <laughs> So this this door ain't gonna be yeah. much of a thing. It's not it's so. not a tool it's not a tool of the dexterous, let's put it that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, I I get the axe out and uh like I like hold it up to Mick and I'm like yep, yeah, I can I can try. Okay, I'm not gonna make you make a roll to hit it because it's a yep. door. How are you gonna yeah. miss it? So yep. all I'm gonna ask you to do is roll your damage for your axe. Yep. Uh, and th this isn't see if you break it down because you will break it down yeah. but the more the damage yeah. the less time it'll take you okay so. okay so it's going to take you a couple of minutes to break the door down yeah. so presuming you're happy to yeah, do yeah. that yeah. yeah and i'm i'm not like wailing on it like mad because it's it's a door like i don't <laughs> yeah, yeah. i'm 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 choosing my blows like i i just want to like break all the like like basically the cross beams and whatnot so we can just fold the door okay 
Absolutely. Get right. in there, Jack Dog. Give it some stick, me old mate. Okay, that's absolutely fine. Can all of you please make me a wisdom roll? If wisdom's primary, the difficulty is 15. If it's not, it's 18. Let me know if you succeed. Well, actually, no, I'll tell you what, you, what happens if you succeed. I have failed. Okay, that is absolutely fine. Ooh. Not a problem. Okay, so did anyone actually succeed? Yes. Okay, so obviously the sort of like the squelching and the grunting and the swinging of the axe is, is all fairly noisy. However, as it's going on, you hear this, Lieutenant, you and only you seem to have, you hear this like other noise sort of, but, it, but it's quite difficult to hear with all the swinging of the axe and everything. I mean, Jack does nearly got the door down, but you swear for just a moment you thought you heard something else, but the noise of like the axe is like covering it up. From which direction? It, you, you can't really tell because like you just like, oh, did I hear something? And then it's like, <coughs> 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 right. I'll take a couple of steps close to the gentleman and say, wait, wait, just a second, I heard something. Chuck's off. Wait, wait, oh. Okay, so I'm, I'm. <laughs> just you're frozen. literally just about ready to do like the last <laughs> blow, and you're like, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking to the lieutenant being. Ready to to swing at the door, or maybe someone something else. Okay, as you stop swinging and the the noise sort of dies away, and you all listen, you can hear this. And it appears to be coming from above you. Okay. What do we see if we look up at the ceiling? Okay, you look up at the ceiling, sort of shining your lantern up towards it, and as you look, you can see what appear to be four sort of squirming, like, almost like worm-like creatures that appear to be like tunneling out of the ceiling, like they're literally like boring through the rock. As they're sort of moving, you see they have sort of they have like long, sort of like ringed mouths, almost like lampreys with like needle-like teeth in them and they appear to be slowly sort of like squirming their way out of the ceiling through the rock yep are they within bashing distance well you'd have to do a little bit of a jump but yeah, yeah you can see a, it, you can see you expect if they're left what's going to happen is they're going to tunnel their way out and they're just going to like drop out of the ceiling like pretty much onto you guys yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna like bounce up and take a swipe with my uh, gladius okay that is Absolutely fine. So make your attack roll. They've got AC 12. That is pony. No dice, I'm afraid. You jump up and swing at one of the worms, and just as your, your gladius is about to make contact with it, the worm finishes sort of scurrying out of the and it just like plops down and sort of like falls down towards you and obviously you're swinging at the ceiling so as it drops out you miss it mm. okay um, you all get to act before the the worms what color are they oh. that is most definitely a hit right <laughs> They're a sort of dark, dark pink sort of colour, mate. With maybe a slightly purple tinge, sort of like purplish words. Maybe who can say it's difficult to know in the flickering light. Yes, yeah, British yes. accents. Indeed, yeah. As they as they come out, they're like wearing little top hats and one. No, I'm kidding. Is there like four of them? <laughs> <laughs> there is actually. <laughs> How ironic. Okay, so unfortunately now there's three of them because as mm. you. Uh, as you swing your weapon at them, describe how you dispatch one of these creatures for us. <clears throat> so just as it's kind of falling down, um, I just kind of stick my sword up in the air and it kind of just falls on the sword. And it's it's kind of the, the sword goes all the way through it and it just kind of splits in half. Indeed, it splits in half and you're, you're sprayed with a fine mist of this horrible smelling ichor. 
from out of the creature. The two halves plop to the floor, they wriggle a bit, and then they lie still. Okay, Lieutenant, what about yourself? Uh, I will hold my action rather surprised <laughs> and see, see whether they actually keep burrowing through the floor and leave us alone. Okay, Jackdaw. So I will step aside and, <laughs> and also, um, if it's possible, wait until one plops on the ground and then yeah, get it with the axe. Absolutely fine, make your attack yeah. roll. And obviously, likewise, but, Lieutenant, if you want to like wait for one to hit the ground and then attack it, you can do so in this round. Yep. Okay, here it goes. Uh... <laughs> No, of course it's a it's a miss. That, that's how I roll. Okay, so I presume you're going in with the club, or are you using your axe? Uh, it was the axe that I had uh, okay. to hand. So, so you swing your axe as you do so. However, this thing hits the floor, and the instant it does, it's like <laughs> towards you, and it moves surprisingly <laughs> rapidly as it sort mm -hmm. of heads towards your leg. And your axe strikes the floor. There's a brief glow, like a shower of sparks spray up from the stone. Mm -hmm. And you've left a little indentation in it. Like I say, Lieutenant, obviously, if you want to make an attack when one of them hits the floor, you can do. No, I shan't. I shall wait. I shall have sword ready in hand. Okay, so. I shan't attack. What I'm going to do then is we have three of them attacking. Now, I've only brought up the combat counter because it's got your ACs written on from previously. Just save me keep asking you. So, here we go for the first one in no particular order. So, the first one that's slithering towards Jackdaw's leg. Oops. Hits. Okay, so... Okay, so as its sort of lamprey-like mouth latches onto your calf, Jackdaw, you feel a powerful burning sensation where its mouth sort of clamps onto you, and you can see like a sort of clear, viscous liquid dribbling down the side, which appears to burn your flesh, causing you one hit point of damage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the one that's plopping down on Big Mick... Also hits. Okay, so this one lands dead center on your chest, Mick. And as I've described for Jackdaw, as its mouth like clamps onto your chest, you feel this horrible, almost like chemical, like burning sensation, and it damages you for three hit points. And finally, the one attacking the lieutenant. Hits. And another one clamps onto you, Lieutenant, causing you three hit points of damage. So all of you, apart from the Friar, have got like one of these worms clamped onto you. What I want to do, if I can, is drop my sword, pull out a club that I have, yeah, that's and fine. then try and uh, use the club to... Um, Smack the one that's clamped onto Big Mick um, in such a way that I can kind of knock it off. Um, okay, I am going to say, obviously, because it's clamped onto Mick's chest, if you miss, there is a chance you might hit Mick. Yes. Okay, so like I say, they've got AC 12, so make your that roll. Oh, nice. <sighs> yeah, Roy damage. Five again. Oh, six. Uh, no. Okay, so describe how you dispatch another one of these worms. Um, <coughs> yeah, so the one, it's kind of, it's obviously biting into Mick, and <coughs> yeah. I just kind of come along and just, um, with my little club, just kind of clip it, um, 
and uh, it just kind of disconnects from Mick and it flies out against the wall and it hits the wall and it smashes. And indeed, um, that is exactly what happens. It slides lifelessly down the wall. As you smack it off Big Mick's chest, you can see like from the wound it's left, it looks like these creatures are secreting some sort of corrosive saliva. You see like, where it's bit Mick's chest, there's almost like a round like burn mark on his chest. Not, not nasty. Okay. Okay. Jackdaw, you've got one of these things clamped onto your leg. Oh, Steve. Oh. Cheers, Fry. Nice Cause, shot. Because it's <laughs> on the leg, uh, I will, I will spin my axe around so that the the head is is pointing downwards. I, I'm trying to like lean on the thing, <laughs> like squish it off my leg. Okay, I'm gonna say you don't have to roll the hit because it, it's not moving anymore. So you just need to roll your damage. Yeah. Let's see. Uh... Ah. I lost my sheet. Okay, there we go. Uh, damage, axe. Yeah. Okay, so describe how you dispatch this creature. Yeah, so it's clumped on the leg, so I, I just, like, basically put my leg out, I flip the axe around, and I just, like, scrape it off with the axe end, and uh, uh, it... I guess like it, it pops off eventually when the the actual like connection uh, yeah. ends. There's and, like a, uh, it's like a yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I uh, I like smack it a couple of times uh, and uh, that's 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 basically it. Uh, so I did realize, uh, which is why I didn't go like hog wild on the thing. I did realize that there was something in the like the spit. Yes. Of the thing. And indeed, so, as you as you sort of like force it off your leg, there's a brief moment where as you look down you can see, like I say, one of these like red, angry looking burn marks on your leg. Mm -hmm. And as it's removed and like air makes contact with it, it's quite a painful stinging sensation. Yeah. As though it had sort of so, like burnt through like the top few layers of your skin. Yeah. So I like gently pummel it to death. <laughs> Absolutely fine. Your your gentle pummeling <laughs> spells its end. So, Big Mick, as you're sort of like looking around and you know, thanking the fry for your help, you can see that the lieutenant is the only one with one of these um, worm-like creatures still attached to him. What do you do, Big Mick? I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of grab hold of it with my offhand okay. to like stretch it out. And then kind of, you know, kind of pair okay. it off, pair it off. That is absolutely fine. Again, you don't have to roll to hit it because it's clamped onto him, so just roll your damage. Oh, marvellous. Okay, so you, you pull this thing out and you start soaring through it. However, it appears to be quite a tough thing. If you imagine the, um, if you've ever seen a cow's tongue, the, the skin of these things as you're holding it has a very like similar sort of slimy but quite tough texture to it. So you're like, with your gladius, like... <coughs> and you can see like you're slowly cutting through it and like this sort of, this fluid that seems to serve it as blood is like sort of dribbling down to the floor. However, it's still clamped into the lieutenant. Lieutenant, what are you doing? All right. Well, as soon as it's stretched out, I shall come at it from the other end with uh, with my dagger. Actually, it might be easier <laughs> than a sword. Okay. So yeah, I'll come in so I'll form like a, a scissor action with the, the gladius and, and my dagger. That's fine. Roll your damage. And damage is. That's what I believe. <laughs> it's a toughie. <laughs> okay, it is a toughie. Uh -huh. However, between yourself and Big Mick, you're able to like saw through this thing. And once you've cut off the rest of the body, it's easy to pull the, the sort of mouth part off yourself. But again, you have one uh -huh. of these sort of like angry red, almost like burn marks on your skin that's briefly sort of tingles quite painfully as it's exposed to the air. You, mm. you look around, you all shine a light around for a few moments, but there don't appear to be any more of these creatures evident at the minute. Or that you can see the sort of like the four like holes that they've sort of bored in the, the ceiling. 
I'm going to scoop up all the ones that aren't entirely splattered. Okay. And I <laughs> Well, I'll I tell you what. Roll me a D4, Jack. Dog. Okay. That's a two. Okay, yeah. So you're able to scoop up. In fact, two of them have been splattered, but two mm -hmm. of them are in like a reasonably okay yeah. condition. Yeah, somewhat intact. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll bag them. Uh, no problems. For later. <laughs> I wouldn't go trying to smoke them, Jack Doyle, if I was you. No, I was, I was thinking of maybe, uh, depending on how the thing actually works, either drying them out and making powder out of them, which you could then, uh, I don't know, maybe toss into someone's eyes if, if there's a confrontation. Mm -hmm. Or depending on what the consistency of the thing is afterwards, maybe you turn it into a poison, apply it to a blade, use as necessary. Nothing as run as uh, uh, as run of the mill as a pie then or anything like that. See, my old man would probably make them just straight into a pie. That is a very smart way of killing someone. I hadn't thought of that. Well, they're usually, to be fair, they're usually dead before he puts them in the pie, but there no, are I mean, exceptions. You you put the poison in the pie. You you put the worm oh, poison oh, in the pie. Oh, yeah, and then you serve it to someone you yeah, want dead. You're a scary fellow, Jackdaw. With the danger past, Jackdaw resumes his attempt to batter down the wooden door. You deliver a mighty swipe which finishes off the door. It collapses into like a wet, crumbling motion. And as you all peer into the chamber beyond, you can see what appears to be obviously the remnants of the door. As you glance in, you can see on the southern wall is what appears to be the mouldy remains of some sort of desk. It looks like the the sort of northwest wall of this chamber appears to have collapsed and there's what looks to be a, uh, a sort of earthen tunnel perhaps delving into the rest of the mound beyond that okay and is that true if that's okay and what's in the top right hand corner Okay, as you head into the top right corner, you can see as you look at it that one of the flagstones appears to have been partly lifted and then sort of replaced, but it's obviously not been put back fully in. It's sort of still at a bit of an angle. Okay, so I would like to take out a dagger and just kind of pry it up and see if there's anything underneath. Yep, not a problem. You prise it up and you can see there's a, a small sort of hidden space underneath it. And there's one appears to be a slightly corroded but intact metal box with a lock on the front of it. Okay. So I'll uh, call over Big Mick and ask him if he can uh, open this lock for me. Not a problem. Let me just have a little... Uh... Little shifty, see if I can work a little bit of magic here. Probably, it's probably just got a little bit, uh, a little bit seized up. Okay, so if you're trying see to sort of like pick the lock or jimmy it, Mick, you yeah. would be making a dex roll. Obviously, dex is just one of your primaries, so yeah. the difficulty is 15, and you get to add your level to the roll. Uh, okay. We have a wood. Whoa. Oh, that's a boom, film. a natural 20. Okay, so I'm going to say with that stupendous roll, you sort of, you bring the you bring the box close to the lantern that your group's carrying, you know, just get an extra light on the job while you're doing it. And as you're, as you're getting your sort of, your tools and your dagger and whatever ready to pick it, you notice that there's some sort of mechanism sort of built into the area around the lock it's camouflaged extremely well to just look like the ornamentation of the lock, but it's definitely some sort of mechanism. And that causes you to like pause momentarily. You're not sure what it's for, but it's Ooh. definitely not part of the lock itself. 
Oh, this looks a bit dodgy, Fry. There's something going on there, something much amiss. I don't like the look of this here contraption. Uh, I think some further investigation is required. I I come up to, to Big Mick and I like offer him the axe. Yeah, very subtle, Jack Door. Very subtle, mate. I think we need a little bit more finesse in this instance. I offer him a, a, a like a fillet knife. Yeah, closer, closer. However, I suspect some of these here probes that I might just have about my person would be more in order. No problem. So you turn the lock, the the, the box away from you, so, and you sort of, you you reach over the top of it and sort of like keeping your, your hand well out of the way and you sort of like jiggle this this knife around in the lock as you do so what appear to be two metal spikes come out of the mechanism they're about yay long and like obviously oh. if you'd have been holding the box yeah, sort of yeah. going like that those spikes would have probably gone into you yeah yeah nasty um and do they sort of stay out once they Done the, their biz. They stay out for a few moments, then very slowly you hear like a of the mechanism and they're sort of wound back in. And once they wind they wind back in, like little bits of metal drop over the ends of them, making it now you know where they are, you can sort of pick out where they are, but like if you're having a casual look, you yeah, would yeah. not know they were there. Yeah. You think as well with your amazing role you got previously, you you managed to get a bit of a look at these two spikes as they came out before they went back in, and you think they were hollow. There's clearly something um, significant inside, I would imagine, and I, I, I do I do I think I can pick this lock without in, endangering myself? You're pretty sure now you know what to expect. You can probably keep it turned away from yourself. So, like, come at it from over the top and pick, yeah, it, and just, pick it without too much danger to yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll say I'm not going to make you make another roll for that because you've already rolled for it. So, okay, yeah, I will do that. Okay, so you pick the lock again. The two spikes come out and then slowly mm. start going back in. However, forewarned as you are with your knowledge, you're you're not in any danger of getting hit by them. And as you open the lock you're able to lift this sort of metal bar off the boxes now can now be opened okay let's uh, f flick it open okay yeah you open it what? now now the box is unlocked the sort of opening it doesn't seem to trigger these two spikes it seems to just be like fiddling with the lock that does that as you open it you can see inside of the box as you're sort of looking at it in the light of your lantern what appears to be a small silver crucifix it appears to be some sort of parchment or scroll sort of bound up with wax and a ribbon there is a small book which you're not too sure about big mick but friar if you can see it you recognize there's a small prayer book and as you're sort of as you're sort of looking at it a little bit in the light fry you can see that the the edges are obviously you've not opened it yet but the edges of the pages appear to have a sort of gold tinge to them there's also what appears to be a another smaller box inside this um, no lock on this one when you open it up obviously carefully there's what appears to be um around about 20 or so like little um wafers like you'd use in a communion inside it and miraculously they still seem to be like fresh they've not gone stale or moldy okay uh, can I open the prayer book and read it and see what it says? Yeah, you open it, and as you're looking, as you sort of open it now, you can see that the it's not like a full prayer book; it's like a sort of travel prayer book. But each of the pages appears to be made of gold leaf, okay. and you can see there are there are a lot of the prayers that you'd associate with the worship of Gael in it. However the slight variations to what you're used to perhaps because of the different branches of the church of gale and obviously this being an emerald sort of gaylight prayer book but by and large you recognize about like 99 percent of the prayers in here just like i say with small regional variations okay and can i examine the scroll to see if it's interesting in any way okay you open this scroll 
and sort of written on it in Latin in quite fanciful um, terms. It appears to be a prayer written on it and this prayer is calling upon Gale to freeze the hearts of the unbelievers and render their movements as mud. Okay. Okay. Um, and can I examine the crucifix? Is it... it? It appears just to be a small silver crucifix on a chain. Uh, Big Mick, looking at it with your sort of knowledge of like prices and like, you know, how to offload stuff, you make a guess that if you found the right person, you could probably get about 50 gold pounds for that. Okay. Just because it's, it's such a nice, sort of well produced. Mm -hmm. metal piece and obviously it has religious significance nice bit of craftsmanship there indeed yeah. nice bit of schmutter and, okay. and, a t and a tidy little box there i don't know if uh, that that might be of interest to you jack door got a nasty little trap on the front maybe uh. we could uh, lure someone into <laughs> coming a cropper <laughs> First pies, now boxes. It's all going on. It's all going on. <laughs> so, Mick, explain to me the danger in the box, because obviously there is some. How does it function? What is the threat? So, now, when the box is shut, uh, I'm not quite sure about locking it yet, but let's say you shut the lid and you, you push something and it becomes locked or whatever. When you tamper with the lock, boom, out comes a couple of these nasty little hollow spikes, which I suspect may well contain some kind of noxious poison that would endanger your health. Where are the spikes in this contraption? Uh, and I'll show them the little covers. I'll say, the, the, see these bits here? They slide out and these spikes come forth, catching the unwary unawares as they would be by definition <laughs> indeed we need a little bit of redundancy in that statement <clears throat> so uh john does it look likely if you were to take out a knife to like dig these spikes out like i'm not concerned with like preserving the mechanism okay i want the i want the spikes and or if there's like a container of poison Okay, so now, now that you guys have obviously opened the box, you expect that the, the, the spikes actually are sort of like concealed in the, I suppose, the sort of like the bottom of the box. They like slide back into the bottom of the box. And presumably, if Mick is correct and there's some sort of poison or such like in there, mm -hmm. there must be some concealed in the, the bottom of the box. There must be yeah. a reservoir that holds yeah. said poison. Yeah, there's a false bottom of exactly. some kind. Yeah. So probably like poking around for that, like tapping on the thing to get like different sounds. Yeah, you tap on it and you're pretty sure that a small rectangular section of the the bottom of the box is fake. Yep. So Mick, if I dig into this, <clears throat> if I pull this open, do you think well, there's going to be spikes? Well, uh, it's, it, that, seems, uh, that seems a little bit unimaginative, Jack. I thought you might have been able to press this finely crafted box into a bit more of a, you know, you might have been able to preserve it intact and come up with some sort of clever scheme rather than smashing it up and just robbing out the poison. I thought you might have been able to, you know, use it as bait in some clever oh, yeah. scheme. For when I go to the masquerade ball... With the yes. Mad Queen, I will yeah. gift her yeah. my heart in a box. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Now you're thinking, see? I knew you had it in you all along. I knew you had it in your heart. So, so, so how big is the box? <laughs> the, the box is like, like the size of an average shoe box, basically. Yeah, okay. So I guess for the moment... You could keep a few I... knives in there or something like that. <laughs> A little very, overspill. A little very overspill. handy in a fight, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, so I, for the moment, I will I will just like carry the box. 
Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. fine. Oh, I'll, I'll get it. Get to it when there's when we're not in a tomb. <laughs> the heroes examine the strange board tunnel, and after a few moments, conclude that it probably houses more of the unpleasant worms they faced earlier. Not wanting to risk further danger, they decide to have a look at the desk on the southern edge of the chamber. So as you head towards the desk, you can see it's sort of covered with mold and you sort of brush a bit of the mold off obviously taking all precautions given your previous experience with mold spores and stuff like that uh, as you're clearing the mold away you can see it looks to be the, the sort of mouldering remnants of an old writing desk and there's the faded remains of what must must have once been beautiful angels carved into the, the sort of writing surface but like I say the the molds have eaten into the wood you can see there's like a single drawer on it but aside from that, it looks it, pretty unremarkable. Okay. Um, so having learnt my lesson from the the box, um, can I examine the the drawer for traps or uh, devices or yeah, anything that looks out of place? I can make me a dex roll. Obviously, if, if dex isn't primary for you, it's difficulty 18. You don't get to add your level because you're not a rogue. Okay, so... Uh, no. Okay, you... To be honest, like checking for traps and stuff it isn't really your vibe, but no. you, you open the desk anyway and there's no... Nothing untoward happens. No, no, no spikes come out, no nothing like that. But all you find inside the drawer is what appears to be a small book, but it's heavily covered with mould and has suffered from damp. You can see just from looking at it, like pages are crinkled and stuck together. Okay, so I would like to uh, use my dagger to um, try and um, open the book kind of halfway and see if I can get some indication of what was written in it. Okay, you prise it open, and unfortunately, all of the the damp seems to have like completely erased or made indecipherable the words on the pages. However, as you sort of like continue sort of like flicking through it, using your dagger to prise apart these stuck together pages, in the back cover you find what appears to be a small brass sheet, quite thin, and it's inscribed with a poem about the noble knight Sir Chide hunting through the Dolman Wood with his pack of faithful hounds. And most beloved of all his hounds was the great dog Flagir. Taking the brass plate, the group returned to the small ruined chapel to examine the other door. Well, opening the door to this room is no problem and it appears to lead to a corridor that then takes a sharp right turn. Okay, so if everyone's happy to continue, I guess I will just walk up here and then look around the corner. Okay, so you're peering around the corner of this corridor. As you do so, you're looking into what appears to be a large, and it must have once been a fairly grandiose hall. You can see there are four pillars in the centre of the room made of stone, and they appear to have fanciful and intricate carvings on them, which appear to be depicting a number of figures attired as holy crusaders, warring against these slight ethereal fey looking creatures and fighting them against a background of roiling Corinthian style foliage. Okay. Um, so if I go up here and I look north, what do I see? Okay, as you look towards the north, you can see what appear to be appears to be a large set of double doors made out of smooth stone. There's some sort of inscription on it, but you can't see at this distance. Now, looking to, to the sort of the recesses to the, the sort of like the west and the east, just near to the door, you can see what appear to be two large stone hounds, each of them very large, about six foot tall, sort of statues, and they have chains running from collars around their neck to these large stone double doors. Obviously the hounds are these here. 
Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so um so can I examine this door in the south or well, what I assume is a door in the south? Yeah. It's a, again, it's a, a set of double doors, um, again, made of stone. Okay. Can I try and push them open? It appears to open into what appears to be a some sort of crypt. There are five sarcophagi in here, sort of stone sarcophaguses. Um, two of them are open um, and they're sort of like pushed to one side. Uh, they appear to you can just about make out tarnished brass plaques on the heads of the however what strikes your notice more than any of this is a large crack in the center of the room and floating above it in the air in the sort of tall domed roof of this chamber are what appear to be two skeletons and they appear to be dancing slowly above the crack arm in arm waltzing in midair above the fissure each of the skeletons is covered in a a slick coating of some sort of purple hued slime or ichor and as they dance over this crack the slime dribbles down and drops into the crack okay okay uh, which two are open it's the two so let's see if I can highlight them there we go. So this one here and this one here. So the two on the west wall. Okay. As you as you're sort of looking in there, you the skeletons momentarily pause as they're sort of floating and whirling around each other in the air, and they turn their their sightless visages towards you, and in your head you all hear a quite a cultured sounding gentleman's voice saying oh visitors splendid will you not join us in a dance um uh, i don't know skeletons yes. danced um you, you hear coming from Again, from inside your head, you hear a, a woman's voice sort of laughing. <laughs> um, who are you, pray tell? The, the skeletons don't respond to that. However, they continue waltzing around and slowly start spinning around, joining their hands together as though they're in the middle of a, a courtroom waltz. Okay. Um... So I will. I, I, I guess I want to step into the room, but I want to stay away from the skeleton so I don't get any of this ichor yeah, dropped on me. That they're, they're floating. Basically, if you try and move across the the crack, you're going to have difficulty getting across it without getting any of this stuff on you because it's like. Okay. So if I can, I want to get into this corner and examine the opened. Uh, sarcophagus yep that is absolutely fine so as you examine this sarcophagus you can see that it appears to be empty however as you look at this um, brass plaque on it you can see that it says uh, it has a person's name on it and it says my beloved mother lady amaranda and as you sort of brush away very gently you brush away a bit of the mold Underneath the brass plaque is what appears to be a small and very faded vignette or sort of painting showing what appears to be a tall, elegant looking woman with a quite quite a prominent hooked nose who is sort of holding a book up near her face. So. Okay. Okay. So then I think I would like to come across here and examine this sarcophagus. Okay, that's fine. You skirt across, giving the slime a wide berth. As you look at this coffin, you can see there appears to be... This obviously has a lid on it. Are you going to try and take the lid off? Yes. Okay. The instant you start touching the lid, the two skeletons like stop their waltz 
turn their faces towards you and they immediately with this banshee like howl swoop down towards you trailing this purple echo behind them okay uh, and they are literally just going to swoop straight into you and attack okay can i turn on dead before they do you won't have a chance to turn because they literally just swoop in and go for you but um okay. we'll, we'll do their surprise attack and then we'll do initiative yep okay so the first one let me just bring up the turn order okay and the second one okay so they swoop towards you you sort of duck down behind the the stone sarcophagus and as they sort of slash at you with their skeletal hands you can see like the ends of their finger bones are quite sharp you sort of duck down behind the stone sarcophagus and they scrape the stone however can you please roll me a d6 friar okay okay that's absolutely fine because as they go like this trying to get at you they splatter slime as they're flailing around but sheltered by the sarcophagus none of it lands on you it sort of sails over your head and splatters into the wall Stepping out from behind the tomb, the friar calls on the power of Gale to repel these undead abominations. These skeletons drift away from you, not in a sort of in a sort of sense of fear or in a hurried way, almost languidly they drift away from you, trailing this slime, and they drift back up to the ceiling and they slowly start revolving in their dance, almost though you've been forgotten. Okay. Okay, so the NPCs have obviously withdrawn. Lieutenant, what are you going to do? Uh, well, <laughs> oh, it's up to them out, man. Friar, well done. I thought, <laughs> I thought we could have been in trouble, huh? As you're saying this, Lieutenant, you're looking around, you can see there's like numerous areas on the floor and on the walls of this room now that are sort of, they've got splatterings of this like purple slime on it. So as they swoop down, they were just sort of dripping it and they were spraying it as they were flailing at the fryer. So there's, it's going to be quite difficult to cross this room now without stepping in some, putting your hand in some. Uh, yeah, uh, are we going to search each of these? Um, sack up? Did, did you find out who that one belongs to? Uh, no, as soon as I tried to open it, I got uh, kissed by skeletons. Um, However, Fry Dunster, as you sort of, as you say that, obviously you don't touch the lid again, but as you sort of lean down and you sort of look at the plaque and the the portrait on this, you can see it says, to my beloved elder brother, Brandy with the good. And you can see a, a slightly balding man with little round spectacles, his head's bowed, and you can just see he's leaning on what looks to be a staff in the little sort of portrait. Okay. Um, yeah. Good impression there, John. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that LARPing, mate, see? That's how mate, it pays off. Yep. Um, I suspect what we're looking for is not here. Um, yeah, I think it's probably in the larger one. So perhaps we should um, withdraw and leave these uh, skeletons to their dance. So, Lieutenant, you sort of pick your way across the room, avoiding the slime. Fry, you're just about to step through the door when you, you sort of step to the left to avoid one pool of slime and accidentally like put your foot in another one as you do the instantly as soon as you touch it like this slime goes and like rushes over your entire body coating you in this sort of like purplish viscous slime and as it, do, it doesn't cause you any harm you can still breathe but as it rushes all over you you start to feel very light and you start drifting up towards the ceiling floating up Okay. Do I have time to jump out of the room? You can try and get out of the room, but obviously your feet aren't on the ground now, so okay. you're, you're sort of like you're floating up into That's the cool. air as though you were as though you were like filled with helium, like you're a helium balloon, or you were lighter than air, okay. and you're sort of drifting up. 
Okay. Um, and is there anything I can grab nearby to keep me down? Uh, yeah, you, you you grab hold of like one of the doors and you're sort of holding on. But as you're sort of holding on, like your your legs are sort of going like that as you're sort of holding on to the okay. the door. Obviously, the rest of you guys can see this. Um. So what I want to try and do is pull myself out of the room, um, if I can using the wall. Yeah, I shall so, stifle a laugh. Okay, so <laughs> but holding on to the wall and the sort of flagstones, because obviously it's stone, you do sort of pull yourself out of the room. But as you go into the room with your companions, you're still sort of, every time you even like let go, you're still sort of like drifting upwards. So you're having to okay. hold on to something permanently to like hold yourself down to the floor. It's as though um, gravity had ceased to exist for you. Okay. Here you go, Fryer, you're moving up in the world, me old mate. <laughs> With the friar's new weightless condition as a potential problem, the group begin to experiment and discuss how they might potentially deal with this until the effect ends, if it is actually going to end. As part of this, their minds turn to the predicament of the skeletons and how they came to be in this animated state. The only problem it is we go back. Orig it's originating from them, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They seem pretty nasty, though. I don't know if you want to mess with him. Yeah, well. Just something obviously way. came into the hole. You know, something broke into the room and contaminated the bodies. But there's that big old crack in the ground. Yeah. Now that um, the rest of you guys are reflecting on it, that the shape of that crack looks awfully like the crack, the purple crack you saw in the sky in the clearing. The winter clearing. You mm -hmm. you did indeed. You remember you remember Smudge remarked on it, and he said uh, how, how thought, it was yeah. staining the snow purple. And he was like, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm giving that a wide berth. <laughs> yeah. he, he, yeah. he said he didn't know what it was. He he said he thought maybe it was like the enchantment that sort of kept the glade going was like breaking a bit. Oh, right. Because like the worlds were coming too close together. But he was like, what do I know? Just, just a goblin, mate. With his condition not improving, the friar turns his attention back to the two slowly dancing skeletons in the chamber to the south of them. Um, does it look like they're causing the slime? The, or do they seem to be getting less slimy as more of it falls off? They don't appear to be getting um, less slimy as, the, uh, as it's going on. Um, However, can you all make me a wisdom check? And in light of what you said earlier, I'm going to give you a plus two bonus, Mick. Obviously, 15 if wisdom's a primary, 18 if it's not. So let me know if you succeed. Get out, Jack Uh Yes, for me. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, for everyone. Yeah. Okay, so. Obviously, as you're all sort of looking up towards these skeletons trying to work out what's going on, and you're sort of going, oh, where's this slime coming from? You can see that, although it's very difficult to see because of like the flagstones on the ceiling, there's actually a hairline crack running along the ceiling, and slime appears to be slowly dribbling out of, from the ceiling. Most of it's falling on the skeletons and sort of coating them as they're moving around. And the rest of it appears to be sort of dribbling into the fissure. You know the two caskets where the um that were open? Yeah. Were they enslimed? There was a bit of a residue on the one that uh, the friar looked at. Yeah, obviously you didn't go far enough into the room to look at the, the one that's more southerly. Okay. Because you'd have to have crossed the crack and risk the slime. Because I'm just wondering, you know, they're floating about, flying about and dancing. <laughs> Maybe they just got coated up much like the good flyer here. Um, I, I wonder is it worth looking in from the south of the room and trying to see? Yeah, that would be a job for the lieutenant. So he doesn't get accosted by any floating objects. Okay, so what's your plan then, Lieutenant? Yeah, go on, I'll, I'll take a quick walk around. Do, 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 back the way we came. 
Yeah, to, that's to, absolutely to, fine. All the way around. Through that round room. Through the round window. Yeah, n nothing occurs to... Nothing appears to attack you or anything like that as you're moving. And you make your way back to the chamber where you can see the four little plinths with the religious artifacts on. As previously, when you walk through, they don't rise up or animate. And try this door. Yeah, the it, southern door. Again, it takes a little bit because they're stone doors. But you push them open and you see you're at the southern edge of the chamber with the two skeletons dancing and you can see Fry Dunstan <laughs> hanging onto the door at the opposite end of the room. Give him a wave. Right. <laughs> as as you're doing that, the the skeletons sort of like slowly revolving around each other, move a little bit towards you, and a, a rather jolly, like I say, sort of cultured gentleman's voice says, "Oh, a visitor! Won't you join us in a dance?" Uh, perhaps another day, my lord. Um, could could you tell me what what has happened here? This this chamber appears to have suffered some damage. Well, the, the upkeep on a the upkeep on a manor is no trifling thing. And obviously, this isn't your head, but you can all hear it. The upkeep on a manor is no trifling thing, good sir, even for one of my wealth and means. However, myself and my darling lady wife Amaranda are just taking a turn around to the ballroom. And and again, you hear this you hear this woman sort of like cheery laughter, and she says. Well, well, good husband, I can see that this uh, this stranger, uh, this visitor to the manor is obviously a man of uh, a man of breeding and martial prowess by his look. Uh, don't don't pester the man, husband. I'm sure he has more important business than dancing with two old footy duddies like ourselves. That's uh, quite right, quite right. But if you should care for a dancer, um, of course, feel free. And they, they, they sort of laugh jollily and they carry on revolving in the air, waltzing around with each other. Uh, would you mind if I had a look, see so if there was a suitable partner amongst uh, these resting places. They, they stop as you say that, and they, they look at each other, and the way they're moving, it's almost like they're having a discussion, but like you're not hearing anything. You're just sort of seeing them sort of go like that as they're, they're looking at each other, these two strange, like, purpley skeletons. Get, get ready to run. Then the, uh, <laughs> the then the gentleman's voice says, "Well, as long as you don't, as long as you don't disturb any, disturb any of um, my sleeping relatives or any of the furnishings, I, I have no objections to you looking. But uh, remember, good sir, one looks with one's eyes and not with one's hands." And he waves his skeletal fingers. I shall bow, and uh, the, the skeleton with... returns the bow with a flourish. I shall look with my eyes at the legends upon the three sarcophagi closest to me okay no problem so looking at this one here you can see that this the sort of like the plaque on that reads my darling sister emmeline the chaste and there's a what appears to be a small woman but her face is covered in a veil she's cradling a small black cat in her arms Now, obviously, you've been able to look at this one without uh, too much worry about the goo, but if you're going to move further in, it's going to start becoming an issue. <laughs> I shall you, risk it. You could look at the one to the west of you, the 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 other open one, if you wanted to just look at the plaque without yeah. sort of getting covered. Okay, unsurprisingly, given that you know the other one belongs to Lady Amaranda, you see that the the plaque on this says, My dearest father, Lord Brigforth with. And you see a stocky looking, almost like Brian Blessed esque looking man with a round head and a, a big bushy beard. And he's got like a slightly ruddy cheeks on this faded painting. And he's like, Not wanting to risk exposure to the slime, Lieutenant Uffington returns to his companions via the more lengthy, circuitous route. Meanwhile, Fry Dunstan has been attempting to burn the slime off himself using a torch, but to no avail. Seeking any means to extricate himself from this situation, he addresses the floating skeletons. Lord Brigford Witt, um, I seem to have caught myself on um, your uh, dancing bug. Um, 
and I have business elsewhere. Is there any way to extricate myself from this dance? You hear the, the skeleton sort of move a bit towards you as they're sort of dancing around each other, and you hear this this booming voice again say, "Yes, well, the waltz is all the rage at court, so I'm not surprised that you you've courted, good sir." Uh, uh, however, I'm I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to with the rest of your speech. Uh, why don't you just uh, give yourself into it and ha have a dance? It'll do you the power of good, sir. Um, I I'm afraid I have business elsewhere. Um... Oh, it's a, a shame, a shame. But understandable, understandable. At which point the the, the woman's voice, Lady Amaranda, cuts in and says, Husband, do, can you not see he's a, he's a man of the cloth? They don't have time for dancing and such fripperies as we. And leave, leave the good father to his prayers and his uh, his his ablutions uh, come away come away husband these are uh, yes quite quite right my dear quite right and they sort of drift off again towards the far end of the chamber dancing with each other i don't think it's anything to do with these characters i think they're victims of it perhaps yeah Whilst his companions are debating what to do about Fry Dunstan's situation, Jackdaw takes the opportunity to explore some of the rest of the tomb. So you peer into the chamber beyond, and you can see what appear to be seven stone statues carved in the likeness of um, footmen, you know, sort mm -hmm. of like standard sort of leather jerkins, um, spears, etc. You can see that each of these statues appears to be holding a different weapon, and they're real weapons rather than like stone carved ones one of them's holding a flanged mace with a spiraling hilt one of them has a morning star one has a battle axe another a war hammer one's holding a long sword with wavy grooves on it that you expect sort of blood grooves on the mm. blade yeah well this, this is that kind of place they have blood grooves on sorry In, indeed <laughs> the sixth statue holds a halberd with some sort of like the moldy tatters of a of a pendant hanging from it and the other is holding a spear with a serrated blade. I will examine these implements of violence over the course of however long we take. <laughs> okay, not a problem. You've got a fair while because the rest of them have been messing around for a while. Uh, as you move in, you can see that the walls here, uh, to the east, so sort of like here, are covered mm -hmm. with patches of yellow and purple moldy fuzz. Mm -hmm. And there's what looks to be some sort of faded mural behind them. It's difficult to see because it's obscured by the mould, but it appears to show the same knightly figure depicted with the hounds earlier. He appears to be on horseback and in the midst of some sort of battle. His right hand is raised up. There's like a big patch of mould covering his hand. There are two hounds running by his side, again, partly obscured by mould. And arrayed against him is this huge army of fey creatures with fanciful armour, goblins, trolls, all the sort of unpleasant fairy creatures. A veritable horde of the fey yeah. arrayed against this lone warrior and his hounds. Mm-hmm. Um, if... I press on on the mold. Is it wet? Okay, so you press on the mold. As you do, there's a and a cloud of spores ah. is released into the room. Can you, please, can you please make me a constitution roll? That is probably not a roll I can make, but I I, I will make the attempt. Yeah, that's a five. Okay, so on your usual form, Johannes. Yeah. You, you take as as you breathe in some of these spores, you take three hit points of damage as you're racked with violent coughing for 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 a, about thirty seconds, sort of like doubled over. Like, <laughs> but you slowly start sort of like recovering yourself, but you you feel sort of like a little bit weakened and drained by the effort. Mm hmm So moisture on my hand once I recover from from this yeah. travesty. Okay. Interesting. Uh mm. Okay, so I will leave that alone for now and <laughs> uh uh continue my uh tour the weapon and uh uh basically go down 
the uh, the list of, of the of statues, starting with the one in, in the corner here. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely fine. You see the weapons as I've described. I give you yeah. a bit more of a, a detailed description since you're looking at them closer. The mm -hmm. flanged mace has a spiraling hilt on it. The mm -hmm. morning star has two inch long spikes. The battle axe, the handle of it, is engraved with a horse's head at the pommel. Mm -hmm. The warhammer has a striking head on it shaped Ooh. like a ball. And as I say, the long sword has blood grooves on it and this alone of all the weapons seems to be entirely free of mold mm. okay so the rest of them are uh, do they have like wooden shafts and uh, are they rotten or the, 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 they don't appear to be too rotten but there are patches mm. of mold on like yeah. the, the, the non-metal bits of all of the weapons with the exception of the long sword that's interesting so the the flange mace then would have a wooden shaft as well. That's correct. Yeah. yeah like okay. I say, it's carved in this sort of like <clears throat> spiraling pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, I tried to make out what was on the pennant, but I guess that's too far gone on the halberd. Okay, you can, as you peer at it, you can obviously you don't touch it because it's got mold on it. But... Yeah, I, I know that now. <laughs> <laughs> you you peer at it and you can just about make out what looks to be the faded remnants of some sort of like yellow sun or something with like the sort of sunbeams mm. coming out of it. But it might have once been gold. You're not sure. It's so badly decayed. There was there was obviously something else on it as well, but that's all just rotten and eaten away. Yep. So what I will do is uh, uh, the uh, the statues are holding the weapons. Are, that's are they like? Are the weapons enclosed in the statues? Like, are they holding them like this and you can't take them away? Okay, as you look at them closer, it's almost as if like the hands of the the stone warriors are just like that and the weapons are like leaned up in them. It's almost okay. as if like these statues have been deliberately carved as like to hold weapons. Yeah. But they're not like gripping them tightly. It's just like the weapons have been yeah. like leaned up in these like open yeah. hands. Okay. So, what I will do is because I have. Uh, since the beginning, I've had uh, around twenty scarves, I believe. So That's I will, <laughs> I will reposition several of my scarves, and make myself to be one of the uh, the Tuscan raiders. Okay. And uh, I will take my bearded axe, and I will, from the maximum possible distance, I will knock the sword out of the statue's hand if I can. <laughs> Okay, you knock the sword out of the statue's hand and it falls to the ground with a loud clang. Nothing untoward particularly happens. However, now you can sort of see it fully now. It's lying on the ground. Mm. You can see that this sword appears to be a lot more thinner and elegant than any long sword you've seen before. You also can't see any signs of uh, like how it's been worked. It's almost mm -hmm. as though it's been sort of extruded from one long piece of metal there's no like signs of like hammer blows or forging mm. marks on it so it's it's is, is it a foil no more it, than it, a... it is it is a long sword yeah okay but like i say it's just like a little bit thinner yeah. and a little bit more yeah. elegant than long swords that seen super before. super fancy uh yeah i mean like say, it's got these wavy sort of like yeah. blood grooves yeah. down the blade okay so since there wasn't uh, any other reaction than the fall, sword falling down. I will gather up the sword. Okay, you pick it up, and like I say, it's it's the yep. size of a normal sort of long sword. However, it feels quite light as you pick okay. it up. Okay, so I will I will do a couple of like practice katas in the, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the room. You, you you swing it around, and you're you're astounded by like due to the the light weight of it, how easily you're able to to swing it around. Yeah, I guess like when when I do that, uh, like I finish the, with like the thought of like, huh, it's so light, and also I didn't know that I could do that. I I did not know that I know <laughs> swordsmanship to this degree. As, you, as you're swinging it around, you almost like wish there was an opponent here to actually like test it on. To be yeah. honest, it's so yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, all right, so I will I will definitely take that and. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess Jackdaw is going to write the rest of the room off because it's, it's being overtaken by the mold and it's 
obviously ruined the things. Yeah. So is there anything special about the statue that had the sword? No, like I say, it just appears to be... Mm. They all appear to be yeah, pretty footmen. much identical as though they've been carved off the same model, perhaps. Yeah. Footmen wearing sort of like leather armor with a bit of chain mail, like pot helmets yeah. on. And they're all just yeah. sort of stood with that one hand sort of like down by their side and one hand like that that's open, yeah. which has a weapon propped in it. Yeah, so I will wander back uh, at whatever point in time, to timey-wimey yeah. uh, stuff. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. No, I was just going to say, uh, the rest of you guys, I see you've just sort of, the lieutenant's just come back and Jack Daw, who's been down this other corridor, comes back in and he's holding this 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 fanciful looking uh, longsword as I've described it. Jackdaw returns to his companions and gifts the strange fey blade that he has found to Friar Dunstan. After a little bit more discussion about what they're going to do regarding the Friar's upwardly mobile situation, the Friar makes his way to the room with the statues of the footmen, intent on testing out a theory. Okay. So what I want to try and do then is touch a statue and see if the goo kind of spreads onto that. Okay, you touch one of the statues and the goo does not spread onto it. Okay. Um, and is the mould on the, the weapons, both the, the metal part and the wooden part? There's a, the there's a little part? bit on the metal bits, but it's mainly just on the wooden parts. Okay, so if I touch the metal part of, say, the battle axe, what happens? You touch the metal part of the battle axe, the goo does not move onto it. Okay. And if I put my... What else, What is? What other ones are there? There's a... That there is a flanged mace, a morning star, a battle axe, a warhammer, a halberd, and a spear. Okay. So if I put my hand around the, the blade of the spear, as if I'm going to hold it the way I held a sword, what happens? Okay, you do that, and immediately this purple tinge flows onto the spear. Okay, and what happens when I release it? As you release it, the spear floats up out of the, the, the open stone hand and lazily drifts towards the ceiling. Thinking of a possible short-term solution, Lieutenant Uffington loops a rope around the waist of Friar Dunster and ties the other end around his own waist to tether him. Then they decide to investigate the large double stone doors flanked by the stone mastiffs. So, the two, the two of you move over to the stone doors. <laughs> as, you, as you're closer, you can now see the inscription on it, and it says, Call to my honoured companions. Okay. And can I examine the two um, hounds? Yeah, they appear to be two large statues, like I say, about six foot tall, and they appear to show two sort of large, uh, almost like Doberman-style dogs, mastiffs, like sort of sat up as though at attention, so sort of the heads raised slightly. They look, they have a very noble cast to their features. They're extremely proficient carvings. And they're both sort of facing each other in front of this these two stone doors. And is there any indication of the name of either of them? Not that you can see. One of them could be the, the dog from the poem. Realising that they only have the name of one of Sir Chide's dogs, Lieutenant Uffington returns to the chamber with the strange dancing skeletons to see if he can elicit more information from them. Uh, ex Excuse me for uh, interrupting our dance. The the skeletons stop and one of them detaches and drifts lazily towards you. And a female voice in your head says, Oh, it's that dashing young soldier. What can I do for you, sir? <laughs> oh, I was kind of used to say so, my lady. Well, I, I, was... I, I, I may be an old married woman, but I still have eyes, young man. <laughs> Uh, yes. You hear you hear a husband's voice a bit further back saying, "Oh, my dear, do stop with your ways. You'll embarrass the poor fellow." And you hear she sort of looks back at him, chuckles a, a little, and then turns back towards you. 
I, I was wondering whether you knew uh, such eyed. My, my, my darling boy, of course. I, I and my my friends were uh, hoping to to meet him at some point, but I understand he had a, a couple of. Uh, oh well, I, I'm I'm not sure if you'll be able to meet him. Uh, uh, the minute he's he's away fighting in the war, uh, I do hope he'll return safely. Uh, are his companions with him? Oh, oh yes, there's, there's many there's many companions with him, but many of his men. And any in particular? Any that who may be um, described as companions rather than men or well, well he. <laughs> You think it, you think me a silly old woman when I say this, but uh, he he does have uh, two two of his uh, faithful hounds with him. Uh, my my husband, uh, Lord Brickford, gave him gave him them as uh, pups when he was a boy, and they, they've been quite inseparable ever since. They they were his favourite hunting companions uh, back back in the trouble free days of his youth. Uh, uh, and a voice goes a little bit sad in your mind. Uh, alas, those those days seem so far away now and it, it never seems to feel warm anymore in the forest the, the, the snow never seems to stop falling i feel confident he will he will come back victorious oh do you, do you really think so yeah do, and he would bring his dogs as well uh, 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 Fen, Fenrir? Well, oh, you, you must mean flager flager and and his brother, what was his brother's name? I, I don't think I ever knew. He says, oh, no, I, I haven't got time to discuss uh, silly matters like this. Uh, oh, well, 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 won't you take a small turn around the floor with me, oh, oh gallant soldier? And the skeleton holds out a, a purple dripping hand towards you. Refusing the dance, Lieutenant Huffington returns to his companions. Big Mick decides that perhaps they can find some information from the mould-covered tapestry that Jackdaw mentions and makes his way to the armory. So looking at that looking at that uh, tapestry there. Yep. As I said, you can see the hordes of Fadum, as Jackdaw described them, arrayed against this heroic looking crusader Sir Chide, aside this this war horse it's all quite fading like i say huge patches of mold entirely cover bits of it you can just about make out two hounds sort of running by the side of his horse but you can just just about make them out they're mostly covered by mold and you can gonna... see, you can see above where this crusader is is a little scroll with sir chide written on it yeah uh, i'll i'll see if i can Reveal anything more on that little bit of a scroll there? What on the scroll that's above Sir Chide? Uh, yeah, or, or is that not that, got that, any that, mold? That's, on? that's not covered. It, it's just a little scroll with Sir Chide written on it. Well, I'll bear in mind how that's positioned, and then I'm gonna look down where the dogs are, and and see if I can just maybe like make a light peel a bit of mould like a cross section down to see if I can reveal a bit of scroll. Okay as you start peeling this little yellow and purple mould off there's a as this like, cloud of dust sort of drifts into the air make a constitution roll however I'm going to give you a plus two because you've covered your face mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is uh, I'm quite good at con if it's one of your primaries, the difficulty yeah, is 15. Yeah, it is, it is. Uh, how much pluses would you give me? Plus two. Oh, balls. I've got a 14. <laughs> got a 14. <laughs> okay, that is absolutely fine. So let me just check on that. So. You take one hit point of damage as you ingest some of these spores despite your protection. And you're like... <coughs> For about oh, 10 yeah. seconds. However, you have still like peeled the mold off. As you've peeled it off, I'm going to ask you. You can see there's, there is a little scroll above one of the hounds. I'm going to ask you to make me a d6 roll. If you get a 1, 2, or 3, it's the hound you already know about. If you get a 4, 5, or 6, it's the other one. Okay. 
Okay, so you peel the mold off and you see a little scroll that says Flager. And I, I, I will try and reveal another bit of scroll in, in the vicinity of the other dog, maybe. Oh, yeah. Right. Thanks, thanks just, to the protection of your, your sort of cloth that you've pulled over, the mold spores don't affect you this time. And you uncover a second scroll above the second hand. And it says Shedder above it. Shedder. C H E D R. Aha. Well, I will pull up the waistband of my trousers, puff out my chest, and go a waltzing back to the party. No problems, feel free to move Looking yourself Looking smug. Okay, gentlemen. <clears throat> Cheddar would be the name of the dog you seek. <clears throat> Gorgeous. Would you care to call on the two? Young Michael. What's that, sorry? Would you care to call on the companions? Yes, uh, Cheddar and Flegel. Okay, you shout out the names, and there is a... And the double stone doors open to reveal a circular chamber in front of you. As you're peering into it, you can see what appears to be a large stone sarcophagus in the centre of the room. Beyond it, on the north wall, is what appears to be a hanging portrait depicting the fair winter princess. Long flowing blonde hair, white robes, star on her brow, standing amidst a stone circle. As you look at it, you can see that it appears to be an artistic rendering of the stone circle that you saw earlier, just to the south of this tomb. However, as you're as you're peering in there, you can see what appears to be a hazy, transparent azure outline of a figure. A thin man drawn with age, wearing plate mail with a helmet visor raised. He has a sad, forlorn expression on his translucent face and is kneeling, looking longingly up at the portrait. Um. So can I call out uh, Lord Chide? Is that his name? Sir Chide, yeah. Sir, Sir, Sir Chide. Chide. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you you say that and he stands up and like I say, you can see through him is a, a hazy, transparent azure or lilac spectre. He, he turns around and he says, I mourn for my lost love. Indeed, and she mourns for you too. He, um, I wish when you see a look of hope in his eyes and he holds out a, a sort of hazy, transparent hand towards you and he says, that, that, and you have seen her, you have seen my beloved, her, her who was cruelly taken from me, and, and, have, and yet we can never be parted. Indeed. Um, she sent us here to find your gold ring. Um, she believes that with that gold ring she has found a way to reunite you. Um, you say a look, you might of, live. a look of hope kindled in his eyes as you say this. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I believe that um, if we were to take your ring back to her, that she would be able to reunite you and your love could um, live on eternally. He, he, he smiles a little bit, his thin face stretching, and he says, yes, the... The ring is here, and he gestures with his other hand at the stone sarcophagus in the centre of the room. My, my love gave it to me that even death would not be able to part us, and my, my my spirit lingers here in hope of seeing her regain, despite her father's wrath. Um, please, and if you can help me, I beseech you, please. Um, tell me, what do you know of this Icar that um, flows through the um, the the tomb. He, he says the, the the ring that was given to me by my beloved. It, even now, it it strives to bring the two of us together. But those who those who interred me in this place 
did not understand or, or approve uh, of my relationship with her. They, they, with with some power I do not claim to understand. They, they hold us apart. But even now, the the enchantments of my beloved, embodied by the token that she gave me, strive to bring us closer together. And as they work on the worlds seeking to pull us together and the enchantments that keep us apart slowly crumble the i believe that the magic that is used to keep us apart is somehow rendered down and transformed into this form colored by my, my desperation to be reunited with her and he looks down at his own sort of hazy purple outline okay um, do you know of any way to uh, remove it from me? He, he, he looks at you and says, uh, I, I, I do not know, but uh, c c come closer. And he holds that hand towards you. And I will step in to... He... Uh, no, you won't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll drag him in. <laughs> Okay, so the lieutenant... Bring forth the purple balloon! <laughs> the, the, the lieutenant drags you in and the, uh, yeah. the hazy spectral figure of Sir Chine sort of reaching out his hand as though to like grasp your arm in a, in a in a friendly sort of salutation. And as he touches your arm, the purple tinge on you seems to flow off you into him, making him more solid and less translucent. And as the purple okay. tinge flows off you and all your possessions, Slowly and gently, you sink back down to earth. Oh, nice! Yeah, excellent. Thank oh. you very much, Sir Child. Um, N not at all, and it's the least I can do. It. And now he's saying this, he, he looks almost solid, you can still just see a little bit through him, but he's a lot more solid than he was a moment ago. Okay, um, so with your permission, I will open the sarcophagus and try and retrieve the ring. P please, a anything you can do to reunite me with my beloved. Okay. Um, so I will move to here, minus the rope, and push open yeah. the sarcophagus. Okay, as you look down, you can see that sort of carved on the lid is the likeness of Sir Chine lying amidst a, a leafy bower. You push the lid off it, with, and it falls to the floor with a crash. Inside, you can see a skeleton wearing armour that is the same as the, the spectre of Sir Chine. Upon its wrists is a pair of copper bracelets engraved with owls. On its finger is a gold band inset with a moonstone with fittings in the form of woven branches. Okay. Um, can I cast Detect Magic on myself? On yourself? Uh, oh, sorry, just cast Detect Magic generally to see what's magic. Yeah, that is absolutely fine. You cast Detect Magic, the ring, obviously the, the spectre itself is magical, the ring is also magical. Okay. Uh, is the sword that Jackdaw found magical? Yes, it is. And how about the crucifix from earlier? The crucifix is not magical, no. Okay. Okay, so the ring and the sword. That's correct. But not the armor or the braces. No. Okay, so uh, with as much uh, gentleness and respect as I can, I will try and remove the ring from the bony fingers. That is absolutely fine. You pull the, the ring gently off the skeletal finger, and as you do the, the Spectre of the Night, smiles and like a morning mist it disperses and vanishes and you're left holding this gold ring with this moonstone in it okay so here's hoping this is a good idea and uh should we head back and see the princess i would say yes yeah definitely what are we waiting for the group make their way back to the portal of floating candles, taking the ring with them. They pass through it and find themselves once again in the winter glade, with Princess Snowfall at dusk's tower standing before them. Slowly they approach the large foreboding wooden door. Yep, 
you, you knock on the door and you're a voice from inside go who is it um it is friar dunstan here to see uh the princess i have a uh, wonderful news he's like yeah well i'll be the judge of that what's your news uh my news is for the princess you hear a, a slightly duller sounding voice from behind the the door go i reckon he's lying griddle grim why don't we just munch him and crunch him and then you hear like a you always say that. Stop messing about. Go out, go outside and see who it is and see what they're about. Grid or grim. At which point the door opens and this large sort of clay-like figure with a huge head, a spindly neck and grey clay-like skin emerges from, squeezes its way through the door and stands up to like this hulking sort of ten-foot-tall hairless figure wearing like crude hessian clothing covered in moss he has a, a large sort of knapsack leather hung around his waist and you can see what looked to be like humanoid bones covered in moss poking out of the pouch he like I say 10 foot tall glowers down at you and he's like why should i let you in uh i carry news from the princess uh, for the princess from her uh her loves her child. He, he just like stares at you and he's like, I could crush you and cover you in moss and eat you. You could try. Don't you remember us from last time? Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. <laughs> Good answer. Are you, are you going to let us past? He, he look. He, he looks. He sort of like raises a hand for a few moments, and he looks uncertainly back at the door. And he's like, "It's them from before, Grid or Grim. They want to come in and see the princess." At which point, a scrawny goblin with grey skin pokes his head out the door with yellowing eyes, and he's like, "He's like, nah. They won't be able to handle it. Look at them. Mortals, a lot of them." Well, that's not exactly accurate. I seem to, uh, I seem to think. He's like, hold on a second, and he he reaches like inside behind the door and pulls out some little specks, perches them on his nose, and he goes, "Yeah, Mickle, Mickle. Peers, at, peers at you, Mick," and he's like, "All right, you can go in." Uh, well, lads, do you want do you want me to take the ring, or can't you let my companions in if I keep an eye on them? He's like, oh, hold on a second, and he, he sticks his head out the door, and he's like, Smudge! Smudge, where you at? There's like silence around the clearing, and he's like, oh, where's that little knobhead got to now? At which point, Greta Grimm's like, I saw him go through a trap door a bit ago. Ain't you, seen who, him since. Who are you looking for? Smudge, did I hear you say? He's like, oh, he's like the yeah, he's, a, he's like, I can't be... You're alright, but he's like, I can't be letting any of these three through, not unless they've, um, you know, like last time. They've done the mushrooms, they've done the mushrooms. He's like, I can tell if someone's still got that. Hold on a minute, I've got something here. And he, he he goes back in the door and he like rummages around. He comes out what appears to be like a big glass jar full of mushrooms. And he goes, there you go, you've been here before, you know the drill. Take one of these, I'll let you through. A rich man, this straight away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's getting a taste for him now, the old lieutenant is. Okay, so, lieutenant, roll me a d12. something and I'll tell you what happens to you. <laughs> okay, can you please roll me a d6? Is this the Middlelands mushroom table, John? Or Nah. No, no. It's, it's all Winter's Daughter, mate. Oh, is it? It's, it's, the, it's the random shroom effect table. Oh, was that a 6? 
six I roll a D4. That's a four, so just roll a D6. Uh, yeah. Take the wrong one. Down. Yeah, it's affected with my eyesight. I must run. <laughs> These old UK designers love their mushrooms, don't they? Okay, as you eat this mm. mushroom, you suddenly feel new new vigour and new strength flowing into your limbs. Your strength score has increased by one. <clears throat> ding, 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 ding. You, you get a whole like, Popeye effect going on. <laughs> <laughs> Spinach <Okay>. mushrooms? <laughs> <That's it. laughs> okay, Jack Doyle, roll me a d12 for your shroom effect. Oof. I die. <laughs> okay, roll, roll, roll me a d6. Oh, boy. That can't be good, man. I'm on a roll. <laughs> okay. So, so, as Jack eats this mushroom, you feel your stomach go... <laughs> and then there's this, like, this noise of... Like, and suddenly... Jackdaw grows in size to double his normal size, shred Jesus. shredding his clothing <laughs> until after like a few moments, Jack like double size Jackdaw, like buck naked, is stood next to you. However, you do double melee damage while you're in while you're in enlarged. Yeah, I form. bet I do. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got Still giant you've got you. giant Jackdaw, Lieutenant Strongington. <laughs> <laughs> Right, let me Jack try Dor so. Has Jack Dor got a pair of like raggedy purple trousers now covering <laughs> um, up his genitals? I'm now <laughs> Jacked Dor. <laughs> okay. If you're popping a shroom, roll a d12 for him. Uh, two. <laughs> okay, roll me a d6. You become smaller? Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> you pick up a fucking lilliput. Uh, okay, so, so Fry Dunstan eats a mushroom, and again, your stomach goes. And then, over the course of the next few moments, suddenly the fry goes and disappears. Yeah. However, eventually, you hear this like high pitched sort of squeaking noise, and, and when you look down, you can see that the fryer is shrunk to six inches tall. However, all of your clothing, etc., seems to have like shrunk with you, so you've not, not lost okay. all your gear. Oh, that's good. Okay, I'll stick him in my pocket. Uh -oh. Yeah, you you took him in like your pocket, so he's like peeping over the top of it. Has the, has the ring shrunk with him as well? <laughs> yeah. So, gr gr griddle grims like, go on then, in you go. The companions head inside the Winter Princess's tower, Jackdaw slowly shrinking down to his normal size as they move. They're eventually able to attract the attention of one of the Fey custodians, who recognises them from their previous visit and conveys them to the princess's bedchamber. You see the large canopy bed, the jewellery boxes, the dressing table, the fancifully carved wardrobe, all the sort of plush furnishings you saw previously. And you see, sat sort of cross-legged on the bed is Princess Snowfall at dusk, her beauty and otherworldliness fairly shining forth from her like the rays of the winter sun. She has pale skin, the colour of fresh snow, and a, a flashing crystalline star on her forehead. She, she looks a little sad, but still regal. But as she looks over and sees you all coming in and obviously recognises you, you, you see a faint spark of hope in her eyes. And then suddenly, whoosh, the fryer expands <laughs> to his normal size. Boing. Uh, Your Highness, uh, we have returned and we have found the ring of Sir Shied, Um And I will hand her the ring. As you take out the ring, you see hope and sort of like tears glittering in her eyes, and they actually freeze and turn into small crystals of ice as they. They fall down her beautiful face. She she takes the ring off you and she slides it onto her finger. You see she's what got she's already wearing a ring that's the exact match of this. And as she puts the ring on her finger, the the translucent phantom of Sir Chide appears next to her and she says my love, you've returned to me after all these years. He embraces her, seeming to grow sort of more material 
with each moment that passes and as they embrace he becomes fully material and he says yes my love no one will ever keep us apart again and they they kiss and grasp each other in a loving embrace they stay this way for a few moments and then she she turns towards you all and says you have you have my dearest thanks from myself and my beloved for bringing us together I, I should warn you though the now that we are together the the magics that were pulling our two worlds together will swiftly begin to dissipate and the worlds will quickly start to drift apart within a day or two i would not be surprised if the the archways cease to function alas my father's will still binds me here at which point sir chide taking a hand says yes but at least if you have an eternity here it will not be an eternity you spend alone and he he shouts out in a, a loud triumphant voice youth and vigor seeming to flow back into his once aged face strike up the wedding instruments bring forth those who would say the vows and those who would bear the witness for there will be a wedding here today and at which point he turns to you fry dunstan and he says friar you and your companions have done so much for myself and my beloved princess might i ask one more favor of you certainly sir child i i was raised in the faith of the golden angel the glorious gale whose light shines on us all and i would consider it a, a personal favor if as a priest of gale which i can tell you are you would agree to conduct the wedding for myself and my beloved at which point the princess snowfall at dusk smiles and nods her head uh certainly um the least i could do for a fellow a follower of the golden angel at which point turning to turning to you all princess snowfall at dusk says yeah, yes we will we will conduct the ceremony immediately we'll, after all these years of being apart i would not waste another precious moment without being united with my lover please f conduct your your mortal wedding ceremony and then we will talk about your reward so we'll quickly we'll quickly sort of whip through this effectively over the course of the next few hours the the princess and sir chide and yourselves head down into the hall below the the feasting hall which is quickly cleared out all of the guests in there seemed relieved that finally after all these like umpteen years there's actually going to be a damn wedding and they can like get it over and done with but in a dignified way you know um, <laughs> so before long you with with remarkable swiftness the the goblins and the household servants redecorate this room bolts of cl blue cloth uh, woven icicles all sorts of fanciful things until it resembles it's as though you'd shown a fay uh, a portrait of a church and gone could you make that for me so it, it looks a little bit like a church but there's like this fat like the ch the the chairs are made of sort of rapidly grown trees the the flowers are frozen crystals it's a a most odd scene there's goblins gathered fey knights fey nobles etc and at the front standing close together are sir chide now wearing the the ring that the princess was originally wearing and she wearing the ring that you bought to her and they stand with you guys on either side of them as witnesses and obviously Fry Dunstan leading the ceremony. Obviously I'm not going to make you go through the whole like wedding spiel <laughs> Fryer. But um uh, probably a bit rusty. Just make me a charisma roll and you can add your your level to it. Okay. I'll I'll tell you you're not gonna fail this role because you can't fail to do a marriage ceremony. You know the words. Just don't get a slung out. Okay, so yeah, it goes pretty well. A lot of the a lot of the sort of fey guests don't really seem to understand what's going on and don't really seem to see the point of it, but as long as the princess is happy, they're happy. So 
you, you go through a slightly abbreviated version of it. You know, you may kiss the bride, etc., which they do. And as they as they do, they almost uh, again a wave of this this sort of beneficence and love and joy seems to to roll through the room. Everyone seems to smile a little wider. Everyone feels a, a warmth in the corner of their heart. And as the as everyone starts filing out, all of the the Fey guests now leaving or heading off to other parts. Princess Snowfall at dusk, her beloved Sir Chide and yourselves, and a few of the staff who are like clearing away are the only ones left. The princess turns towards you and she says, "As I, as I told you, I have." I, I cannot think of a, of a fitting reward for all that you've done for me, but I, I have I have many jewels here, much treasure which I can give you, and also as we said, as we spoke previously, I have the boon that was given to me in my youth that I may grant one mortal their heart's desire. You have simply to name, to na I, I would give you some time to discuss this between you all, and uh, and she, she, won't you have decided? I will happily bestow this reward on you. And she drifts away to stand next to Sir Chide, leaving you all alone to discuss what you wish your reward to be. The group discuss what they wish their reward to be, and for a moment the lieutenant thinks of his poor Juliet, trapped below the streets of a bishop's gate, but he shakes that off, realising that the needs of Great London, and perhaps the world as a whole, are far greater than his own. <laughs> as, you're, as you're sort of discussing this, uh, Sir Chide walks over towards you, Jack Dorr, and he says, uh, although, although my power is not so great as my beloved, it, it would be within my power to bestow a, a small boon as a, as a sign of my thanks on each of you if if you were to wish for one small thing what would it be for me yes for, and i pointed myself for yourself I, I will ask each of your companions as i've said uh, I, I i do not yet understand the the full extent of my abilities but ask for for a small boon and if it is within my power i will grant it after all it is the least i can do given the eternity of happiness you have bought me He's going to go into contemplation for a bit. He says, a... perhaps if you wish to think about it, I can return to you in a... Yes, you do. You... The thing is, I don't... I don't want a lot of things these days. And then, like, I'll, I'll motion for him to, like, okay, move so down he, the line. <laughs> he, he, he moves along to, to, to Big Mick, and he, he repeats the same speech, saying, if, if you were to wish for one small boon, what would it be? Mick will sort of... Um look around to see who's watching and then he's he's gonna like <clears throat> lean up a bit closer to the the geezer and kind of whisper well i wouldn't mind being a little bit more appealing with the ladies if you know what i mean and I, and strip, uh, no, no, uh, nothing uh, nothing rude like you know nothing uh, racy uh, just just maybe the, the rest the nose of you. and the rest of you don't hear Mick ask this, but you all hear when Sir Chide steps back and he's like, <laughs> 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 and all right, all right. <laughs> he, he, he looks back at you and he has a he has a warm-hearted smile on his face and he he, he, he puts his hand on your shoulder and he says, uh, "My friend, if it is if it is love you seek, then you simply need to have confidence in yourself." And as he sort of puts his hand on you, you feel you actually feel like so. You're like, yeah. Do you know what? I've I've done some shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and your charisma increases by one. Nice. Oh, at which point he, he he smiles and not in a sort of mocking way, but he's in a sort of like mm -hmm, you sort of way. <laughs> and he, <laughs> he, he, he he sort of he. he he claps you by he claps you by the shoulder and then he, he walks across to to, to, uh, <laughs> to Lieutenant Duffington and he says, um, my, my friend, 
as a small sign of thanks from myself, although my power be not great, if there is any small boon I can bestow upon you for for the high service that you have rendered to myself and my beloved, s simply name it. <clears throat> well, <laughs> that is one thing I seek amongst all other, and this um, glorious service that we've just been through today. Um, yes, I, <clears throat> my beloved, was taken from me. At which point he, at which point he sort of like he puts his hand on your shoulder in a sort of a, a comforting way, and he says. I, I too know something of lost love and you have my, my deepest sympathy. How, how was she taken from you? Uh, she died, but was um, raised again. He, to he, he nods and he life. says, again, I, I know something of this matter. Now, whichever would be easiest, either her to return to my world or me to go to her, if you could do either one. I would be satisfied. I am. I'm not sure. Which, I'm not sure what you ask is within my power, but if, if you will wait, but a moment, I, I will speak to my beloved. And he walks. He walks across to her. You can't hear what's going on between them, but they're having a, a conversation. As their conversation finishes, you see the princess reach up and she takes up the jeweled star off her forehead and passes it to Sir Chide. He walks. He walks across to you, sort of cradling a gift in his hands, and he says. Uh, I've spoken to the princess. T take this to your beloved. May it, may it bring you together as you have brought us together. And he offers before this I, crystal star to you. Before I take it, this is not the boon that she uh, said she would give to us as a group. It is no. This is this this is this is, a, this is a gift from myself to, to you. A small, a small thanks from myself. I'm honoured to take it, and I shall reach out and take it with both hands. And uh... he, he holds this small crystal star. It doesn't look like it's like a gem, like it would be particularly worth loads. It almost feels like it's it's made of ice, like there's a slight chill to it. But when you like touch it, there's no like water coming off it. It's not melting or anything like that. Yep. So I'll just, I'll just stand there with it, held in my hands and staring down at it. At which point Sir Chide finally turns to yourself, Friar, and he says, Friar, you have brought myself and my beloved together. Likewise, if there is any small boon that is within my power to grant, you have only to ask. Um, <clears throat> is he fully solid now? He appears, he appears to be so, yeah. Okay. Um, so... I want to just kind of put my hand on his shoulder and just go, um, the happiness you have brought Lieutenant Uffington is enough for me. Um, and is a, is a service I may never be able to repay. He nods and says, you are, you are truly worthy of the, the vestments that you wear, Friar, and may you May the light of Gale shine upon you. Thank you for the service that you've done for us. You are very welcome, Sir Shai. And he he returns back to your south jack door, and then he says, "Well, my my gaunt friend, have you have you had time to consider your what small reward you would ask of me?" I don't know what lies in the scope of your otherworldly power but there are there are many veils that one wears when one is alive and these are all lifted when one passes beyond into the realm of death we can see many things many distances and we know many things that are hidden from the living well then while I remain flesh. Give me a shroud to hide me as I take my vengeance on those that stole my crown. He, 
he, he nods and says, please wait but a moment. He he walks over to one of the, the sort of last of the Fane knights who is still lingering about, and he has a, a sort of hushed conversation with the Fae knight, at which point the Fae knight takes off his white hooded cloak that appears to shimmer like diamonds or snow and he, he brings the white cloak over towards you and he, he holds it out to you yeah uh, I will accept it okay as you accept the, the robe it appears to turn a sort of light grey colour and it, as you sort of like as you test it it appears yeah. as though it would perfectly fit you yeah uh, I, I guess I'll put it on because I, I... I didn't actually like Jack <laughs> didn't know what to expect. I was like, oh, it's an actual thing. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so he, he he's trying it on. As you put it on, you can see that it almost the texture and the, the colour of it appears to shift to match whatever you're standing against, adding to like camouflage and sort of hiding in shadows, etc. Uh. So Chai says that this is this is the cloak of a of a Fey knight. May may it shield you from harm and from unfriendly eyes. It is the least I can do for your help. Uh, I hold out a hand. He, he uh, sort of clasps your arm in that yeah, sort of warrior's yeah. like. And this, this is something that is probably like a little bit more instinctive than anything like he does consciously, but I do the, the warrior shake as well. He, he, he smiles at you and then he, he takes a few steps back, retiring away from you all. At which point, Princess Snowfall at dusk steps forward and then says, Well, my my mortal friends, have you decided what the, the main part of your reward will be? Think carefully, for this is a gift I can bestow only once. Uh, indeed. Um, so, uh, it is my heart's desire to see the laughing plague in great london eradicated and the afflicted cured while ensuring the laughing play can never return she holds one hand to her to her chest and holds the other up in the air closes her eyes ringlets of golden hair flowing over her face her brow creases in concentration and then she she looks at you friar and says it is beyond my power to entirely remove this plague. It comes from a different place that is as different from my world as my world is from yours. However, I have done the best I can. I have bound the essence of the plague into a single form, a beast. If this beast is slain, with it is slain the plague. And whilst this, and because the essence is confined in this beast, no more will the plague roam your home. I hope that is, yeah. I hope that is sufficient. It is the best I can do. That is more than sufficient. Um, and we thank you very much for, um, we know it was a no small thing to, to do. Not at all, my friends, given the, I would have gladly sacrificed far more for, for the joyful days I had that you have bought me. It is my only regret is that with the worlds drifting apart again, and I could feel it in my my bones, that this may be the last time we see each other unless you find a another way into my world. I fear the portals will only remain for a day or two. Well, we will always remember your world uh, favourably. And neither myself nor my beloved Sir Chide will ever forget you or the help that you have given us. Go with our blessings, our hopes and our good wishes for the future. May they take you safely back to your homeland. At which point <coughs> Sir Chide nods. And smiles um, and I will just kind of nod and smile and kind of not really know what to say and just kind of <clears throat> um, start ultimately heading for the door 
Yeah, no problems. You will start heading for the door. Yeah, Mick will just like nod and most uncomfortable with the situation and minimises what he says. He's just sort of like nods and smiles and mumbles a few thanks and okay. shuffles away. As, as you guys are sort of heading out of the door, there's still a last few sort of like fey guests who've like stopped to like chat with each other, you know, at the sort of doorstep just before they depart, presumably to whatever fey realm lies beyond this glade. There's a some men, women, knights, servants, etc. Just having a bit of a chat, and as you're uh, as you're walking out, Big Mick, one of these fey maidens looks over towards you and gives you a a coy smile. <laughs> there you go, boys. Uh, a, a beautiful willowy creature with long, flowing silver hair. I'll give her my best cheeky, chirpy, chappy grin back. And a bit of a bow and all that stuff. My best intent, my my uh, best impression of courtly manners that I can rustle. Up. Okay, the, the, this maiden looks at you in, in a in, in a, a beautiful lilting voice that sounds as though someone had taken the most desirous female voice in the world, dipped it in honey, and then coated it in moonbeams. She she smiles at you, lays a gentle hand on your shoulder, and then says, uh, "Is is it really is it really true that you have to leave our realm so soon, brave mortal?" Well, the... I might have a I might have a bit of time on my hands if Vince is you asking so nicely. She, she gently sort of <laughs> curls a ringlet of your hair with her finger, and then says, "The." The world of Phrygia has far more wonders and pleasures to offer than this damp little oubliette. Ah, oh, fascinating. Perhaps you could uh, g give me a, a brief tour. It would be most uh, interesting. I'd love to see. Of, of course, if that is your wish, it has been far, far too long since I have entertained mortals at court and such a such a unique specimen as yourself would surely be welcome oh you flatter me with these kind words and i'm sure i could soon catch up with my companions they need not loiter cramping <laughs> one style <laughs> okay uh, at this point, can you please make me a charisma roll? Oh dear. This could all go badly, chaps. Alright. Ooh, or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay, so you're sort of divided on this. There now that this woman's this fey woman's honeyed words like there's a, a large part of your brain that's like, do you know what? Never mind Great London. It'll be all right. We've cured the plague. Mission done. Why, why shouldn't I like chip off into the Fey realms and have like a few years of enjoyment for myself? Don't we deserve it? However, and it's for a few moments. It's almost intoxicating. You find yourself unable to resist it. However, maybe it's this Fey heritage they they talked about. Maybe it's the thought of your old man, your sister back home. But some part of your brain sort of rebels against that and goes. And manages to like keep tr keep hold of the core of your being, despite a lot of you wanting to just become lost in the honeyed words of this fey maiden. So, rather than being like, beguiled almost by her, the choice is entirely yours. Ah, mm. uh, well, perhaps I could set off with just a. Uh, uh... A quick kiss and I'll be off and uh, I'll pop back at a future date perhaps okay so you ask her for a quick kiss and she she smiles and laughs musically and then says are you sure there are there are those amongst mortals who say that once a person has been kissed by a, a maiden a fairy that no mortal woman is ever enough for them again I'll run the risk. 
Okay, so without going into too much detail, she leans over and gives you a kiss on the cheek. And her lips feel slightly cold, as though like a morning frost. And as she kisses you, it basically sets your brain afire with graphic thoughts that we won't go into here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, suffice to say that if you think of like the, the best sort of kiss and intimate relations you've had this has basically come along with like nunchucks beating it into submission and thrown it into a side alleyway and taking its place this is like to be honest for a few moments after you've after sort of coming down from like the high of this kiss you actually like look around because it feels so sensual that for a few moments you're like a bit embarrassed and you look around before they could she's only just kissed me what am i like worried about yeah 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 yeah, yeah. but she she draws back and smiles and then says, well, perhaps a noble mortal we will meet again. Well, I sure hope so. She looks at you and then says, if you should ever find yourself in my world again, Pray come to call at court and ask for me by name. I am the Lady Rhyme. Okay. I will indeed. She she smiles and drifts back to her party that are slowly departing. The pleasure is all mine. And there you go, boys. And that is how that is done. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with a big mick. What, what Watch and learn. That? Watch and learn. <laughs> What exactly is it when when you're doing what, what happened just now? And Jackdo is standing there in his sarong and a cloak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bermond, as far as you guys are saw, there, there was this brief interchange between him and this like, incredibly, almost painfully beautiful maiden. She leaned forward, gave him a bit of a peck on the cheek, and he was like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Then he got like, a, he got like, he like blushed like really like a deep shade of crimson and was like, <clears throat> You watch as the, the, the lady rhyme and her party walk forward. She gives a, a musical whistle and parts of the snow seem to rise up, forming into white horses. Herself and her party climb onto the horses right to the edge of the clearing, at which point the trees seem to depart, seem to like bend and clear a path. They gallop into the trees, which close after them. You can see the you see Grimmel Gridge and Griddle Grim, the, the goblin and the troll sort of stood near the door. And as you you can see the, the little grey gob miserable goblin sort of like waving his hand as though he's trying to get your attention. Uh, so I'll go over and see what he has to say. You, you walk over and he's like Here Which of you lots Dunstan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am. <laughs> He, he turns to the troll behind him and he's like, go on, give it over. And he's like, he's like, what do I have to? He's like, yeah, give it over. And as he's, the, the troll sort of reaches behind himself into what this like premature pile of rubbish and he takes out a sword that you recognise as the Sword of Gale. <laughs> and, and he sort of, he holds it out towards you, at which point the goblin goes, yeah, bloody big gold fella came along and told us to give it you. <laughs> Ah, well, I guess I'd better take it. So, he, the troll it is like, a bit of a chore, but the, the troll's like holding it, it looks like comically small. Like the troll holding it, he's like, "Do I have to give it over, boss? It's nice and shiny." He's like, "Yeah, give it over." At which one the troll sort of glumly holds it out to you. I'll, I'll take it with the biggest smile on my face. Indeed, you do. Now, what I want to know is, is the troll also marked by the flame of Gale in like their aura or whatever? Like they're also chosen? <laughs> he, he doesn't appear to be. Because <laughs> that, that would be, like, we need to recruit that one. <laughs> oh. at, at which point, presumably, you guys all <clears throat> depart from the tower. You head back through the archway. As you do so, however, you see, like, the the candles appear to be sort of like moving slightly and the flames are sort of flickering on and off 
on the archway but you move back through it without a problem as you get onto the other side you don't feel this like warm flowing of like religious awe now and you see that the candles appear to be slowly sort of like dying out and you find yourself back in the tomb as you wander back through it which i'll just sort of briefly cover you head into the the ballroom where the skeletons were dancing you can see that the hairline fracture and the crack in the floor are no longer there 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 is still a little bit of the purple goo about but it seems to slowly be like evaporating and there's just two skeletons lying on the floor no longer covered in slime they're inert they're just they're still holding hands. Um, is there how much of the goo is left? A, a, a few smatterings and it's evaporating as you watch. Within a few minutes, it'll all be gone. Um, I would like to see the two skeletons then return to their coffins. Not and the coffin sealed. Not a problem. The... You, you wait a few minutes for the, the last of the goo to dissipate and you gently lay the the skeletons of the father and mother of Sir Chide back in their sarcophaguses and put the lids back on. Um, and then I think that we should leave. Nothing else to see here. Yeah, I think I'll go. I'll go. Rem I don't know. Should we remove the the, bat, the headband from her, from her eyes? The statue's eyes. <clears throat> I don't. I don't understand the significance of that. Yeah, I will. Yeah, no problem. You take, you have this blindfold with these gold embroidered crucifixes on it. Yeah, I don't know what that's all about. Can I cast detect evil on this and see if it's? It's not. It's not evil. No. However, hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Jack does evil. Yeah. Hey. Um, In case oh, you're in news. any doubt, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we got that cleared up. Right, let's go and find Smudge. Indeed. Okay, so... Yes, we... Sorry, go ahead. We, need to be car we just need to be careful to make sure Smudge understands that uh, he can't come and go anymore, so he'll have to decide soon whether he's coming or going. The heroes leave the tomb and head back to their rendezvous with Smudge, where they attempt to explain that because the worlds are drifting apart, he may no longer be able to return to Fey after a short time, and that he has a decision to make. He, la he laughs loudly and he's, he's like, he's like, what, do you mean like them portal things? Yes. He's like, nah, I don't fucking use them anyway. <laughs> Okay, got a goblin door in it. Smudge agrees to accompany the party, with Big Mick promising to show him the high life of Great London. Mick asks in return whether Smudge would be amenable to showing them around the local sites. He says, yeah, suppose I could do that. Anything in particular you're looking for? Well, I suppose technically adventure, really. Find out a few secrets of the area maybe i shouldn't mind knowing a little bit about this uh this mysterious background of mine he says well i don't know if i like with your mysterious background and all that but uh obviously as i told you a lot earlier what did the wedding go on by the way well the, the friar here carried out the service himself oh thank fuck for that is that right well as i told you they used to send me and my boys out to do like foraging and whatever so yeah we've ranged pretty far in these like woods uh he says uh there's an old uh i, I don't know what you what, what do you call it where any point he waggles a little goblin finger for i don't see that what do you call it there's the the buildings where it's like are all giving it the all Church. Now, um, oh, what's the word? It wasn't church. What's the word for it? Temple. Ab. Ab. 
Abbess. No, Abbey. Abbey. That, that's it. Abbey. That's it. He says, with your monks and that. Yeah. He says, well, one of these, one of my boys said, I didn't see it myself, but one of my, one of my boys told me about it. He said he'd found this place, like one of these abbeys, uh, looked like it had not been used for a bit. And he said, well, when he went to go in there, he said there were all these fellas wearing like robes and like floating about and like glowing in the dark. Weren't purple, were they? Well, he didn't tell me the colour. Mm. He said, but, but yeah, he said some of them you could like see right through them. Mm. That sounds very intriguing. We should definitely go and check that out. And he says, well, wait, tell me where it is. I can show you. Yeah. 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 Lead on. We have to collect, uh, collect a friend of ours first. All oh, right, again. Okay. And you guys head back to the, the encampment. So, which of you would like to make a roll to see whether uh, whether first, do first mate Cartwright has survived? Okay, roll me a d6. And if you get a one or a six, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Okay. So, with that roll of a one, you get back to the the camp, and you can see still sat against the same tree is Cartwright, but he's like... And you can see the sort of slight pallor of death has just started to, to fall across this. He, he must have he must have died about like a day ago, maybe. Like probably, probably a few hours after you guys left. You can see that, um, that the cloth that was at his side is absolutely soaked with blood, but like blood's no longer flowing out of the wound, obviously. And he just sort of sat there with his legs out in front of him, like he's t he's Ooh. turned and he's facing towards the path that you guys left down. As I was obviously like waiting for you guys to to come back, but obviously his wounds were just a little bit too much for him. A bit of a choker. Don't look like he made it through then. No, let us see to his body. him and say a few words okay if you head over towards him and you're sort of obviously you're getting ready to like move him you see that where his sort of hands are like across his chest there's actually a small piece of parchment sort of like clasped in his hands okay so i'll pull out the parchment and see what it says this is going to be heartbreaking but... okay you, you 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 take out the parchment and as you read it you see it in a very like shaky and obviously pained handwriting sort of basically written in mud he's obviously like dabbed his finger in like the mud next to him and wrote wrote it probably over the course of like several hours it says my friends i i fear that i may not survive to to witness your return but i hope that you find a cure for, for the plague if you should return to great london Please tell my dear Anne Marie that I tried and I'm sorry. And then at the end, it sort of like tapers off as his hand obviously fell away from the page. Was he was he a Cartwright, was he? Or was that the captain? That's Cartwright, yeah. Cartwright, okay, so Anne Marie Cartwright. Yep. Okay. And I think as you you bury Cartwright, obviously saying words over him, Friar, and with a sense of triumph that's somewhat tempered by his loss, the, the sort of sad background music starts to play. And as you all turn to follow Smudge into the Dolman Wood towards this ruined abbey that he spoke of, that is where we're going to end the session for this evening. Thank you very much for playing, guys. I hope you all enjoyed it.